Instant Browns Classic. Happy weekend to all of you out there recording this on a Sunday morning. Welcome to another draft episode of the Parking Brown Show. I'm Jacob. That's Casey. Mr. Nick Carnes down below. We are brought to you, as always, by our friends over at Homage Apparel. I've got the the, the stiff arm brownie, the elf, going on today. Uh, link in the description down below. Best uh, apparel brand in the business. I'm rocking the script, Ohio. I just got this in the mail from Homage. Um Something that's super important to me. I, I know they're a sponsor and they have dope shirts, like the quality of the shirt, the designs. But man, their customer service is top notch. I uh, ordered four shirts a week ago. Before I got them out of the pack, I noticed a slight defect. It wasn't even no big deal. Like I could even rock with it. But I, I sent them an email. They said, take a picture. I sent it. Before they even responded back to me, my shirt was in the mail. Like, And that's important, man, because like you could have a cool product, but if your customer service is terrible, I can't rock with you. They were amazing, man. So highly recommend homage to anyone out there. I've got a shirt that very clearly is leaning pretty bad this way. It's not an homage shirt. And that basically says all that needs to be said about that. (laughs) It's leaning. Well, you can tell the neck is stretched out, right? My, I can see your homage shirts. Your necks aren't stretched out. Yeah, man. Yeah. Quality. I got you. Guys, make sure if you're watching us on YouTube, you subscribe to the channel. Give a thumbs up in the video on this video if you uh, like what's going on here. The draft is less than three weeks away now. We are, we are pumping great. ourselves right there, which is just insane. Um what we three weeks from this past Thursday will be night one. We will be live here on this channel. I don't know if all three of us will be, but I'll be live uh, on this channel for the entirety of the draft. So if you want to chat and have a good time during the draft, come join us uh, here on the channel. Uh, yeah, so we're talking offensive tackles. Um, as it sits right here on April 7th, offensive tackle is what I believe is the most likely position the Browns go with at pick 54. It's uh, really. Uh, Yeah, I've kind of been there for a long time. I look at this draft for Cleveland after the free agency period that they've had, and I think to myself, like, what are you drafting for? Well, you're drafting for the future, and you're drafting for depth in 2024. Like, the guys that you're going to take in this class, well, some of them will see the field, hopefully barely, because that means the Browns stay healthy, because most of them will see the field as rotational, Yeah, right? (laughs) <laughs> the Browns stay healthy. What? Um, but you're looking at rotational players. Like if you, let's say they draft another pass rusher, that's probably somebody that sees a hundred snaps this year, you know, barring some kind of injury and, and that sort of thing. But I'm looking at it and I say, where are the biggest depth concerns for me? Offensive tackles where it starts. And also you talk about best player available. This offensive tackle class is loaded. I mean, I look at it and I've got, Let's just talk about first round grades. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, mm-hmm. nine. I've got nine first round grades on offensive tackles in this yeah. class. Uh, and 10 is borderline. 10 is yeah. borderline. My, my number 10 guy is a, is a high number two. And I look at all of that and I say, well, I don't like James Hudson as my swing tackle. I really don't want to do that. And I understand that there's a weird thing with Conklin and and Jones, and we don't know what's going to go on at right tackle. But behind that, I don't know what – I don't want James Hudson. Maybe you kick him into guard. I know Casey and and, and our friend Randy Gersey, we've talked about this. Like, we could kick him into guard, things like that. Hmm. I don't know if they're going to re-sign Jedrick Wills. If they draft a guy at 54 and he's really good, you save money and you let Wills walk. Hmm. Um and all of that coming together, best player available, biggest need, the future. For me, it's offensive tackle right now. It, the, I, f- I feel like it's all but a given that even if they go into the year with the three of Dewan, Jedrick, and Jack, like it'll it would be a one year type deal. Like that's not it's not gonna remain that situation. Right. And you gotta excuse me, I'm a little under the weather. My voice is de- dropped down into the, the basement of octaves, but uh, so th- there's obviously some some depth and some future that needs to be added there. Well, you guys are right. 2025, 
the chance of all three of those guys being on the roster is pretty low. You know, Dewan's the future. Um, there is a world in which Wills plays himself into a contract. But given the larger scope of his body of work, I don't think it's a high contract, even if he were to perform very high this year. I think that you have to take it all into totality. So you got to, if you can, prepare for the future. And to Jacob's point, this is an extremely deep draft. I believe the record for first round tackles is seven, and that was in 2008. Uh, they could at least tie, if not break. I know when me and Jacob have done our exercises, seven's a pretty solid number of offensive tackles. You know, yeah. The, if you get eight in the first round, that's a quarter of the first round to one position. Um, so it, it, this is a deep draft. It pushes some guys down. We'll push them down far enough into the range that if you're sitting at 54, you might be able to move there. Uh, there's some guys that if they slide, would would you be would you be uh, interested in trading up for one of these prospects if they slide? Possibly. There's some good value late, and there's I mean there's going to be guys who slide day three that you could stash, you could draft, not hope to not play them, develop them, and then maybe they are ready for that step in year two. So it's a very interesting offensive tackle draft. Yeah, I can see that on the interior too. I can see them taking both a tackle and a, yeah. and a guard. I did it earlier today for an exercise. And so, do, uh, yeah, my next mock for Browns Wire comes out has a has a guard and a, and a tackle in it. So, um, yeah, day three. I think day three is a great range for a developmental offensive lineman, inside or outside. In um, years past, some of these guys would have went to back end of the back of year t- of round two or day two. But because it's so deep, they're getting pushed, you know, so it's it's a sweet spot. It's kind of like that with wide receiver, too. It's like the mm-hmm. Browns could lock themselves into a really, really good player just because some teams are like, oh, I better go linebacker at this pick because there's not going to be a linebacker when I come on the board in the fourth round. But there will be a tackle that I like, you know, that, that sort of thing. You can see them go that way. So uh, we'll start, we'll start with the prospect talk uh, with specific guys. Uh, Casey, I'll let you take the floor and you can go first with your first offensive tackle. Okay. So I looked at this in buckets, man. Like what, what guys are on your, on your radar at 54 and then what guys are on your radar at 85. And then comes the big quandary for me because I don't think there's a chance in hell they go from, 85 to 156 without picking in between. No, but I doubt it. I don't think that because when it, when you do when you, if you ever do a mock draft, go from 85 and then pause it at like about 130 and look at those names in there, man. There's so much quality. I just think that yeah. AB's not going to sit on his hands and and get he'll get better value. That's just what I believe. So, but if we're we're starting at 54 here, um. You were talking about the offensive lineman that you have draft grades on. One that I think could possibly escape the first round and start to slide is Jordan Morgan. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think there's not a chance in hell he's there by 40. So he's not, to me, he's not a trade up candidate. I think you're looking at someone who slips past 45 before you start to even think of that. The guy who's in my mind, and they're definitely interested, is uh, Kingsley Sumo Mateo. Mm-hmm. He's going to be there. It's going to be interesting. I don't. I don't know. I don't think he makes it to fifty-four. But if he is on the board of fifty-four, I don't think they would hesitate to pull the trigger on a player of that caliber. Uh, good in space, can do both uh, gap and zone stuff. Pro, the, the also when we're talking about the guard rails. This guy fits everything. He's twenty. Just turned twenty-one. Six-six, three-fifteen. Movement skills. The only place that I ever get concerned when I'm watching him is he can be, become a waist bender. Yeah, and 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 lose leverage. He's good at initial, but sometimes that leverage will it'll creep up. Um, but if you're just looking all the tools, every single physical tool you're looking for, he meets the age. He's definitely a candidate that you know you might even work him in at the beginning of the season. You say a Denigy wins the swing tackle, you can kind of groom him into that this year, and then he could be ready to start year two. So Kingsley Sumu Matea is someone I'm super interested in, but. I don't know if you've heard this, guys, but the entire front office and head coach, th- these are th- these are upper, these are all Buddy, Ivy they want guys. an Ivy League guy. They these want an Ivy, Ivy League guys. guy. Well, there's someone, there's actually a candidate who fits that I'm, criteria this year. I'm gonna get there. I'm gonna get there. You do you want me, you want me, do you want to take this this one? Do you want to talk him? Uh yeah. Well, I wanted to comment on Kingsley Sue Mateo real quick. Oh, okay, okay. All right, go for Just it. Just some thoughts yeah. on him. I'll jump then, in the shark. 
Yeah, no, like I'm really, I know what you, I know where you're going, but like, no, I'm with, I'm with you 100. No, with with Sumatia, like you're looking at a guy length, power, athleticism, really good athlete. Uh, what was it, 34 and a fourth inch arms? He's got the mechanics, like you said, six foot five. Um, he plays really well at the point of attack, but his hand placement is, it's not great. If for a guy with levers and leverage the way he has and can play, you're like, man, if you just put your hands where they're supposed to be, like, you're going to take this to a whole different level. Like, he was their right tackle at BYU um, in 2022, the left tackle this year for BYU. So we've literally seen him do it at a high level. Um, the only difference between him at right tackle, he let no let up no sacks as a right tackle, he let up two as a left tackle, I guess there's the learning curve. He yeah, he got yeah. he, he got worked a little bit. You know, I put in quotes like, "Oh no, he let up two sacks." And what was his uh, splits in that? He let up two sacks and 381 pass blocking snaps. He allowed 11 pressures. So like, it's like the year before it was 11 pressures at right tackle. It's like crazy. Like he is a much better pass blocker than I think he is a run blocker. But like, man, we're gonna get into it too here in just a second with with the guy uh, you are referencing. Um, mm -hmm. But man, this is a toolsy guy. Like all those tools are there. And you're going to say that about a lot of these prospects that are going to be in the Browns range. Hey, they've got the tools. Can you work on them on the technical side of things? And I think that's where Kingsley is. I think that's like a, a theme that's – all of this is is pretty new with the Browns where uh, you've got your starters in place. I, I, I feel like the what the Browns could draft – previously when they were so short on talent was such a different pool than what they can look at now because when when the expectations are like hey we don't want you to play right we just want yeah. you to develop you can take guys that have the the physical traits you want that you can mold and and help uh with the the mental or the or the technical side of the game and that's just like not a place we've been a whole lot before so it's really neat to to like take a look at these prospects and say, okay, well, if, if your biggest problem is uh technique, uh, we can work on that. Right. Like, like that's not, we, we don't need you to be out there week one and there's time to, to get these guys right. So I'm, I'm really excited about like, basically that is, as we develop this, the stability with the Browns and, and we move forward, it's like suddenly uh, I think it becomes a lot clearer why some of these teams have been able to just continue stocking the talent so long because it's like when you have guys that are reliable already um that are going to play for you 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 just have more options when it comes to the draft prospects overall yeah for sure um okay so where you were leaning there casey uh talking about they want these i they i think they want an ivy league or so bad uh that brings you to current amagaji uh the mm -hmm. left tackle out of mm -hmm. yale um, I learned how to say his name. You just need to make sure you're saying, you're essentially saying, uh, uh, like, oh my God, G, like, oh my God, G. That's how oh you say it. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, another toolsy guy. Like, that's where you're coming back to with Amagaji is like, there, here is a tool. Guy. And then keep in mind, both Kingsley, Sue, Mattia, and uh, Amagaji, the Browns have had top 30 vis visits with both of them. Yep. So we're not just pulling these names out of our asses based on what we're seeing. The Browns have shown at least some interest. Rather, that means they're drafting them or not. I'm not saying that, but they have shown enough interest that both of those guys have been to Cleveland ahead of the draft. Um, okay, so with Amagaji, 6'5", 325 pounds, um, really still needs work on the technical side of things. He feels like a really raw prospect where you haven't really developed uh, him on the technical side of things at Yale. Um, you're just looking at a guy that's a better athlete and stronger than everybody he's faced in college. And so he dominated him. That's, that's quite frankly what he did. Um, I think he's a really good athlete. He may not be like a, an elite athlete, but he is above average, significantly above average in my mind. Mm -hmm. Um, he can win b against both pass, both uh, power and speed rushers when he's in a in, in a pass protection. Um, again, you're looking at a guy coming from a smaller school. There's going to be an adjustment period. Well, that's great for the Browns. They have the luxury. They have their left tackle. Uh, they have, you know, that's what I said in this my latest mock draft that'll come out sometime this week for uh, Browns wires. Like. 
they've got so many, and Nick, you just touched on this. They got so many luxuries when it comes to this position. It, really, anything on the offensive line, because there's a debate on who will start at right tackle. But in the end, you have your five starters going yeah. into this year, barring injuries, your five starters, we know who they are. And for the most part, we know what they are, you know, and, and you're hoping for some improvements from, uh, you know, DeWand in the running game when he's out there. And then Jed, you're hoping he plays like what he did right after the bye before he got hurt. Um, but I think that Amagaji is immediately the most talented uh, left tackle behind Jed. Like he comes in and I think he can be your backup left tackle. Like immediately. I think he steps on the field and he is that thing. Um, one, one note, one thing to note, he was your left tackle. Uh, he did, he is coming off of a serious quad injury. Mm -hmm. I have heard rumors that it's worse than we thought. And that could mean he falls a little bit, but again, you're not drafting this guy to play in 2024 unless there's yeah. an injury. You're, you're potentially finding Jed's replacement after this. Uh, so he was your left tackle in 23 and 22. He was the team's left guard in 2021. Um, mm -hmm. Over the course of those three years, uh, he allowed one sack in his collegiate career. Um, he had 128 pass block snaps this year, 300 in 2022, and uh, 431 in 2021. And that was the only time he left let up a sack was as a left guard. So this guy instantly comes in, can be your backup left tackle, can be your left guard. Maybe he doesn't end up being a tackle at the next level, and he replaces Joel Batonio as the left guard of the Browns in the future. I think his length and his size and his athleticism translates into a tackle at the next level. But if mm -hmm. it doesn't and you just bust him in the guard, this is a really good problem to have. And you're in this spot with all these toolsy guys that you can just develop and pinch, potentially play two very critical positions on the left side of the line if you need that. And he's an Ivy League guy. And you know they've you know they don't have one. We did this exercise. They do not have one on this roster. So maybe it'll, it'll be very interesting if they go that route. But man, man, yeah. I would do some really fucked up things to get Kurt Amagaji on my team. If you ever go to Cavs games, they have uh, a, a life-size uh, uh, cutout of Jared Allen and his wingspan, mm -hmm. like just to kind of give you an idea of how big it is. Uh, I, I think Amagaji's arms are, are 36 and like three-quarter inches. Yep. Something yeah, like yes, that. Sir. That's something you could put at Brown Stadium, man, just to, to give the, the – like that. that's unreasonable. It's yeah. just it's just a dude that that's that's huge, <clears throat> and if one of the one of my favorite things I love going through like the the pros and cons of like these tackles and like one of the one of the knocks on him is like being overly aggressive and it's like yeah. okay like if if that's if that's your knock and, and, and a quad injury is is one of the other ones I'm I'm pretty sure we're in a good place as a prospect so that combined with you know you know they're they're gonna go. Like the, the the Ivy League story, it, it, it's kind of funny, but it just feels like one of those one of those moves that the Browns would make that that just make a ton of sense. This it would make sense. I think that's the point. It's like they're not they wouldn't be just taking an Ivy Leaguer to take an Ivy Leaguer. He is yeah. an, uh, an elite profile because of the length, the size, the speed, the power. He ha he has every tool. I project him as a tackle. I don't see his, uh, him as someone who will end up inside. And then that's not same for all my prospects. I'm not ruling anyone out because they 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 can start off as a tackle and then move inside later. The Browns need help interior as well, the way I see it. So I'm not ruling any prospect out for that. Um, I will say this. his I love him as a pass blocker. Absolutely love his kid as a pass blocker. And it's, he has excellent quickness into his sets, but it's his ability to mirror after initial contact. Like he is going to frustrate defensive ends. He has an elite side to side after he makes contact. Uh, those 36 inch arms. Some guys can have length and not know how to play with it. He knows how to play with it. Um, I like what he does on the second level as a run blocker. He really brings his hips when he gets to the second level, but he falls off run blocks at the line of scrimmage. And that that's a technique issue, you know, it, and it's being overly aggressive, getting out over your skis. You lose your balance, lose your leverage, and a guy can slide off. Uh, but I, this is a guy I firmly see if they're going to take him, it's going to be at 54. Cause even if he does slide, I don't think there's a chance in hell he makes it to 85. He just, cool. people will hold on to that, those uh, traits. Yeah. It almost reminds you of uh, him being one of those guys, similar to how JOK fell for the Browns, where he starts falling 
Like they didn't take him at 26, even though they thought they might take him. And then of course, ultimately they took Greg Newsom, but then he fell to a range, which was like 10 or so spots ahead of them. And they went up and got him. If for some reason, Amagaji starts to fall, I could see them because I don't know if you guys know, they have got a lot of draft capital next year. There is a lot of draft capital for the Browns right now and next year in terms of trying to um, like uh, go up for a player. So if they choose not to take him at 54 and say he gets to like the 70s, starts to mm-hmm. fall a little bit to like the late 60s, or early 70s, I think they could really go and make a run uh, at that point too. Well. Casey, you mentioned uh, guys that, that have played guard. Uh, can I interest you in a guy like Brandon Coleman, who played tackle last year, but played guard the previous year uh, from TCU, who is also in his own right. He's 6'4 and a half, 313 pounds. Uh, he's got 34-inch arms, so maybe not uh, I'm a gaji like but but still certainly not a slouch. Um, no. A dude who, who is also uh, an athlete and has had a, a pretty solid success with zone blocking. Uh, I think if you're if you're looking for a guy, and we've seen the Browns do this before, where you, where you you draft uh, guys that that have positional versatility. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if he's as high up there as some of the other prospects. That's not my uh, Jacob. I see you nodding. Is he somebody that that maybe? Uh, he's probably a day three guy. Yeah. Okay. Okay, but positional versatility, maybe maybe that's that's the the and, and somebody who who is uh, I believe tested pretty well as an athlete mm-hmm. as well. If you're looking for a guy that that maybe could answer, uh, you know, be your jack of trades, your your Michael Dunn uh, upgrade, is is this a route that you could go? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, um, a guy I'm going to talk about when it gets back to me on my turn, it's the same way, like. You may, you may take a guy that was a, a tackle before and is a guard now and keep him at guard, but you could also go back to tackle. Like it just, it all depends on what they see when he, when they bring him in and I'm, you're not going to get any arguments from me for taking a risk on somebody that has some tools and some, and, and experience at multiple positions, because we saw it last year where that's, that shit got tested a lot for Cleveland. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That got tested a lot. And so if you're like, hey, you're the backup left guard or right guard or what, you know, you're a backup guard, but we need you to play tackle. I mean, hell, they did it with Blake Hans had to do it in the playoffs. Like, you know, Michael Dunn did it in the play. Like, we've seen those things and we've seen them be forced during a game because, you know, you can make moves with the practice squad and move things around if an injury happens on a Thursday practice. But, in the game, you're out of tackles, so to speak. You got to find somebody. Your your hope is one of my guards has played tackle, because otherwise you're really you know putting a, a square peg in a round circle and it's just not working. So yeah, you'll never get any arguments in that aspect from me. There, there seem to be a lot of uh, the critiques on, on these guys of like maintain balance or improve technique, mm-hmm. uh, those types of knocks, and, and that's what I was I was reading with with Brandon Coleman as well, and. Not to harp on it too much, but it goes right back to the situation that we already said. Like if if that's the biggest knock here, if you've got the physical traits and you're you're you have the athletic ability already, it's like uh, okay, let, let's let's let uh, Dickerson get in the, in that offensive line room and, and develop these guys. Let's let's start that process. It's about the canvas, right? You have to have a canvas. If you have the canvas, the artist can put something of value on it. But if you if your canvas is shabby, the, the final product's going to be weak. Uh, so <clears throat> Coleman's a guy. I know that I, I have a feeling I know where where Jacob's going to go with his. So I'll stay off that. Uh, but there's another there's another prospect like that, KT Leviston. Um, we we uh, touched on him last week. I, I just think that there's guys that are offensive tackle size might kick in the guard, but they give you that versatility. And this is, that's something this team will never shy away from is versatility. You know, so I, I think that's something important to keep in mind. You got some guards that are getting older, keep an eye towards the future. So don't be surprised if they take that. Yep. You're up. I'm up again. I thought, I thought you were going to go with someone. I don't much want to steal your thunder. 
No, you can go for it. I've got a couple if I need to pivot. Oh, me too. Me too. I got the chambers loaded. Um, yeah, that's right. Like I, like I said, I, I, I thought of this in buckets. Uh, I'm going to leave the guy I think Jacob's going to go for. I'll leave for him on that. the table. The, like I said earlier, I don't think the Browns go from 85 to 156 with no picks, but there's going to be some guys in this middle range that are going to be day three picks, but more more likely round four picks than when the Browns get on the clock at round five. So I want to, I want to bring up some of them. Uh, Christian Jones out of Texas is, is one, one you need to think of. Uh, to me, he projects as a tackle. I don't see him moving into guard. I've heard some discourse both ways. Roger Rosengarten from UW is another one. Uh, super – Super quick athlete, 6'5", but he's only 300 pounds. This is someone he needs – his technique's ridiculous. He has more pass sets, like different variations of pass sets. Like I think they're going to ask him to whittle it down because you want to be like a master more, more than – you know, a master of one thing than the jack of all trades, you know what I mean? So, But the movement skills are elite. They're going to they're want him to get his play strength up. But then my last one in that same bucket would be Javon Foster out of Missouri. I think you're looking at these three guys that are probably going in the fourth round. The Browns currently do not have a fourth round pick. I don't think that statement holds true on day three. I think they managed to sneak up and there's a, it's a great talent pool. These are guys that are sliding for a reason. These are guys that are developmental guys, guys that you want to get in your program uh, for both Foster and Rosengarten. It's the strength and conditioning program. Christian Jones doesn't have that same problem. And I'll say this because we've talked about a couple of prospects, uh, Jatavian Sanders. So when I was watching Christian Jones again, yeah. I want Jatavian Sanders nowhere near defensive ends for at least a year. <laughs> I mean, it, he was getting mopped. Every time he came on screen during during this cut-up I was watching, it wasn't pretty. But Christian Jones, is he, he's he's nasty. He has, he has an, a nasty uh, temper on the field. Uh, I like him as a run blocker. He's – Sometimes he misses his target on the second level, but there's so many tools to work with, you know, 6'6", 321. Rosengarten has the length, but not the size. Foster's a weird prospect just because he kind of gives you a – he's a B plus. Mm -hmm. I don't see one thing that you look point at and say he's excellent at that. But he has a high floor, good athletic profile. And he played the vast majority of his snaps at left tackle at Missouri. During the senior bowl, they asked him to go to right tackle when he struggled that first day. So I think some people wrote him off. But he really competed hard over the back half and, and really showed his value. So those are three prospects that are going to be in that fourth round range that I think the Browns need to consider if they're able to sneak back up in that range. When you talk about their ability to sneak back up there and, and trade up, they have nine draft picks next year. Um, they have nine picks in 2025. Uh, that includes three sixth-round picks and two seventh-round picks. So Jacob, uh, you might be salivating. Yeah, we have four. They 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 have a one, two, three, four, and then three sixes and two sevens. Mm -hmm. Like it's like ammunition. There's, there's ammunition. I mean, I talked about it. I I did a double. I did a couple of trade downs in this in this mock that's coming out soon. Um, where I added three more day three picks to next year, uh, interesting okay. enough, in the process, um, including a four, five, and six. That's what they were. I got a four, five, and six. But you know they've done this with play. They've done it more so with players than anything. You know, day three picks is how you got Amari Cooper. It's how you got Zadarius Smith. It's how you got Jerry Judy. Like some some relatively established guys. And I know there's some debate on. Um, Jerry Judy, but there's no debate on the established guys in Cooper and Smith. Dustin Hopkins. Yeah, and Dustin Hopkins too. You know, like you're talking about like they use that for players, but they use it for ammunition to get something that they don't currently have. And if that's to go up from 156 into the 130s, maybe? That's exactly what I was thinking, that 130 range, man. Is oh, somewhere for, in there. For discourse – uh, I also tag the PFF rankings on their big board to the players. Those players, I just mentioned PFF, Christian Jones, 130 in PFF, Roger Rosengarten, 152, Javon Foster, 168. So that that's that range to me. Yeah, and it's like, oh, hey, this guy's falling. Let's not risk it. Here's a couple of our sixes from next year. Yeah, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll go up to 140. Uh, go up from 156 to 140 for – two of the sixes we have next year or whatever, it, you know, it's, it, it's one of the, that's what next year's uh, uh, draft content is going to be fun. 
Yes. For one, we'll be back in the, the first round discourse. I swear to God. What, they trade what is me. that? Amazing. Like, if, they, if they do it, man, if they trade that motherfucker, I swear to God. Like, just because, like, I, I, at least if you're going to trade your first again, like, if they do, I don't think they will. But if they do, do it in April so that I can have, like, three months, right. you know, four or five months yeah. of draft discourse talking yeah. about the first round pick. And then, because that's what happened when they traded it for Watson. I mean, well, they, they traded it in March, but, like, it was, you got to have all that wide receiver discourse because it was such a good class coming into there. And, and you got to talk about, uh, at 13, I got told how stupid I was that I would not touch Jordan Davis. That's pretty funny, isn't it? And then that dick, but whatever, I'm stupid. All right. Um, Kansas left tackle Dominic Pooney. That is, that is where I come with a lot of this stuff. And that is because at the senior bowl, they asked Dominic Pooney to play all five spots and he did so well. And that makes him one of my favorite players in this, uh, this class. He's probably a, a, a round three player. They can probably get him there at 85. That's uh, from what I've seen, most of the rankings, that's kind of where he's at somewhere in the 80, late eighties, early nineties, somewhere in there. Um, he has his two years as a starter for Kansas this year. He was their left tackle last year. He was their right tackle, or I'm sorry, uh, left guard. Where did I put it? I put his splits and I, and I didn't move up. So he was their left tackle this year, their left guard last year, had a total of 15 hurries and one, one hit and zero sacks uh, combined between the two seasons. You're talking about a dude in 2022 at 442 pass blocking snaps this year at 342 for Kansas. Um, you know, this year it was eight hurries. That's it. That's all he did in, in pass protection was up eight hurries. Uh, I think he plays really, really has really good hand placement and leverage. He's a really good leveraged player where he gets down under, you know, low man wins and Dominic Pooney is often the low man winning in those situations. Um, I think he's a really good athlete. Um, I think if you come at him, those twitched up pass rushers coming at him with a plethora of moves, I think he can counter them. I think he has enough moves to counter some of those really twitchy players. Um, great uh, arm length. It's elite level arm arm length. Um, and I just think that he is a chess piece who right away, I mean, there's some things he needs to work on in the run game uh, quite a bit. And some of his contact balance and things like that, it, it's, iffy at best, but he's not a mover in the run game, but he also doesn't get shoved into the backfield either. So yeah. that's, that's where his leverage and hand placement comes into some of the contact balance and some of the body control. And the, I have issues with that. And when it comes to the run game, but he's a chess piece that will immediately be a good run blo uh, pass blocker in my mind. So getting someone like Pooney who has been a left tackle and a left guard but also showed that he could play center and on the right side. Yep. That's yep. the chess piece, man. And you can put him lower on the depth chart where he doesn't need to see the field at all right now. And just like each practice, try him out as a different, you know what I mean? It's like, that's what, what that's where I think his training camp and his rookie, uh, the rookie mini camp and stuff goes into play. What they're going to do, I think is just like, Oh, I'll put him in left guard one practice, put him at left, you know, right guard center tackle, like all those things. And so for that reason, he's one of my favorite guys in this class. And I think he just mold, he just fits the mold the Browns, I think, are looking for. That was the prospect that I figured you were going for. So I laid off of it because I read your mock draft earlier this week. <laughs> yeah. And uh, look, man, that would instantly become Dickerson's favorite rookie. Just a, a piece of clay. You know, let's figure out what we could mold you into because he has such a broad skill set. And what you said was true, man. At the Senior Bowl, they moved this kid around everywhere, and he excelled everywhere. Like, to me, that's huge, you know, because that is a big learning week. You're getting a ton thrown at you. And they, they really stressed what his versatility could be. And for an NFL team who values versatility, Dominic Pooney has to be pretty high on your list. I do feel that if they go his direction, that's going to be that 85 range. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're not taking him in the 50s, I don't think. No. Okay. I feel like overall looking at these guys, and, and Casey, you touched on Rosengarten too, uh, there just seems to be consistently this theme of athleticism and quick feet and guys that, that, that aren't just – that have the ability to really move. There's a lot of guys that seem to be good 
um, in, in zone blocking schemes and, and that type of thing. And uh, that's like music to your ears. If you're, cause I just keep thinking uh, there's so many of these knocks. I, I feel like looking at the prospects, you, you read through the profiles and, and, and you talk about these guys and it keeps being like, add weight, add, uh, improve technique, mm-hmm. work on balance, that kind of thing. And, and so when, when you guys started the show, uh, saying, you know, there, there's all these offensive tackle prospects. I feel like that really shines through because when when those are so consistently the knocks, it's like, okay, well, if you trust your development team and, and you've got these these guys that, that don't have to play right away, uh, there is a lot to like. So, so from the Cleveland Browns position, I think – I would the more we talk about this, the more surprised I would be if they did not come out of the draft with. A, so I've been talked into it. You know, Jacob, Jacob, you let off saying you, th- you think the most likely position that the Browns draft uh, first is offensive tackle. I, I don't know where they're going to go with that first pick, but it just feels like a given looking at these guys uh, and, and so consistently seeing what they need is what the Browns offer. So I just think it makes too much sense not to come out of this draft with a tackle. Yeah, this is a team that values offensive line. They value defensive backs, wide receivers. You know, you see consistently you look every year, and these are the positions they they they, they pick up. So they find someone, you know. Um, but I also like want to throw throw a couple tags on this. Okay, there are a couple smaller school tackles in this that are going to be available on day three. That if they get say say the first round doesn't fall the way they think it is, they're not able to get back up in the fourth round. You know, there's a couple prospects that I think like. People need to keep their eye on. The first one is Garrett Greenfield, North Dakota State. Super, super explosive athlete. I mean, this kid had a 39-inch vertical at like 6'5 and 320. I mean, just crazy explosivity. Uh, He's someone that could be in that fifth-round range, you know. But when you're drafting these guys who are from like lower levels of college football – there's a but you need a buffer year. You need, you know, because that's going to very rarely are those guys ever ready to strap strap up year one and, and, and really get with it. Uh, another one is from uh, Georgia State, Travis Glover. I think he's a seventh round pick, but from an athletic profile standpoint, this is a, a guy that you want to get in your room. You want to build and see what he could do. But the upper like the upper bound limits of these players, if you're projecting. Are as starters. These guys have starting level potential, but they're going to go late. They're going to go in day three, and just from smaller schools, they're not going to get the benefit of the doubt of these kids who went to Texas or to Missouri or you know played higher competition because it's easier to project those players. Uh, But just because it's such a deep tackle class, I think there's still value to be had late on day three. And I think my a, a day three sleeper for me, it'll be interesting to see where he goes. Is Ladarius Henderson from Michigan? Um, I think you move him back to guard. Um, He was the team's left guard in 2022 and 2021 before being the left tackle this year. And you can really see the fall off. Like uh, in 2022, he allowed two hurries and one sack. In 2021, he allowed seven hurries, one hit, one sack as a left guard. This year, 24 hurries, five hits, two sacks as a left tackle. Um, But I think he was a pretty good run blocker. What uh, as good as all of those Michigan offensive line yeah, yeah, yeah. have been yeah. as of late as run blockers. And so then there's another guy who's played left guard and played left tackle. And so, like you said, Casey, if you're you start <coughs> excuse me, if you start looking for a guy to fall, or you're looking at a guy at 156, or even after that. Ladarius Henderson just brings a lot of interesting aspects to it because he has a ton of experience. Um, he he's played in over 30 games at, at Michigan. He's won a lot. You know, he's played multiple positions. Really not a great pass blocker on the exterior at, at a tackle, but man, he was pretty good in the inside. So you start looking at these guys. What do you want to bet on? That's what it starts to become on day yep. three of the draft. What do you want to bet on? Do you want to bet on experience? Do you want to continue to bet on traits? Do you want to bet on, you know, um, the technical aspect of it? Like, what are you looking to bet on? Because, like, he brings up an interesting, you know, if you look at Henderson, brings up an interesting thing. Brandon Coleman's an interesting one, like you talked mm-hmm. about. Um, and then – if we're getting really, really weird. Okay. Let's do it. When how about the Howard left tackle, Anim Dunkla? 
Um, the Howard oh, Bison. Howard. If you if you did not know the the uh, um, the mascot for Howard, uh, three t- three year starter at left tackle, um, obviously plays it. Did not necessarily dominate the competition in sm- at a smaller school, so that kind of concerns you. But if you're looking at a dude that like if you want another Dewan Jones, I mean he's six eight, three hundred and sixty five pounds. Okay. Like, like he's he like if that's the mold, and I'm not saying it is, but like if you're just trying to bet on things, you can't teach that. You can't teach six eight. He's got long arms. You can't teach that. He needs a ton of refinement for a guy that is a three year starter because he goes to a smaller school. And um, I like him better as a as a run blocker with that big massive size, but like you want to get really deep, man. Anim Donqua from Howard. Like that's I got into a rabbit hole and, and watched a ton of his tape on on like Friday night at like nine eleven o'clock at night. And okay. It's just like this is a dude that's played a ton of football. If you can fix some of the um, you know, tactical sides of things, he could be a, a decent depth piece. That is the deepest pool you're going to hear on any NFL draft podcast. <laughs> Seriously. Like I'm going to have to check to make sure he's a real person, but like everything you just said, that's crazy. Six, eight, three sixty five. He's yeah. going to be on someone's radar, but these are the players that maybe they might, he might not even go drafted. This might no, be probably already UDFA. And then, you know, because Jacob brought it to the table, you guys will be aware of him. That's awesome. Hey, the, you know what? The feather in the cap is we discussed Keaton Mitchell last year. On yeah. the pod. And like, listen, I hated watching him light it up for Baltimore, but I was like, Hey, we talked about this dude. Yeah. And there he is lighting up the field right there. After so being undrafted. Know. He went undrafted. Undrafted. Reason. Yeah. That's a crime. That's it. Yeah. You know what? Um, this has been really interesting because this is our second uh, viewer decided episode piece here. Uh, you guys took us in the linebacker direction, and then you took us in the in the offensive tackle direction. So thank you for for voting and for all the support. We've been going up a little bit on the subscriber count, the view count, the like count. I've been responding to the comments, and so I will I maintain the pledge. If you comment on the YouTube, I will respond to you. Also, uh, we like Jacob so graciously gets us out there on an iTunes Apple Tune thing, whatever. Sorry, <laughs> uh, Spotify, the whole thing. If if you would leave a review on any one of those platforms, I would love you forever. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm under the weather. What am I going to do? Apple <laughs> Tunes. Apple whatever. I don't know. Apple I don't even podcast. know what it's called. The Apple, Apple podcast. podcast. There it is. I don't know. I want to throw I in front of everything. I'm from that generation. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, this has been an offensive tackle episode. Maybe the Browns' first pick of the Barking Brown Show. I'm Nick. He's Casey. That's Jacob. Go Browns. Yeet. Oh, crap. I hit the wrong button. (laughs) 102.